and welcome to the second topic under the BALSA SBA speaker series, Affirmative Action Chronicles, History, Meaning, and the Legal Profession, featuring Professor Kevin Brown, Dr. Louis Menand, and Dr. Jacoby Williams. I'm Shana Wolf, Vice President of the Black Law Students Association, or BALSA, here at Indiana University Mauer School of Law. I, along with Ashley Skurlock and Alexa Rojas, will be your moderators this evening. Before I turn it over to Alexa to introduce our speakers, for those of you attending for CLE credit, an attendance code for today's event will be announced via the chat feature near the end of the panel discussion. Lastly, the speakers have graciously agreed to take questions at the end of the lecture, and we ask that you feel free to use the Q&A box to submit your questions at any time during the lecture, and Ashley or I will make sure that we get to as many of them as possible. If you do not want your name attached to your question, please choose the option to submit your question anonymously. Again, thank you for tuning in this evening, and we hope you enjoyed the discussion. Thank you, Shana, and thank you everyone for coming. <clears throat> Joining us on the panel today are Professor Kevin D. Brown from the Indiana University Mauer School of Law, Dr. Louis Menand from Harvard University, and Dr. Jacoby Williams from Indiana University. We are very excited to have them here to speak with us about affirmative action and its historical and current context, as well as how it applies to the legal profession. Professor Kevin D. Brown is a Richard S. Melvin Professor of Law here at IU Mauer. He has taught a variety of courses such as torts, race, American society and the law, and law and education. He is also an IU alum who graduated with distinction from the Kelly School of Business with a major in accounting. From there, he attended Yale University and went on to work as his associate attorney for an Indianapolis law firm, Baker and Daniels. At Mauer, he has accomplished more than can fit in a quick inter introduction, such as founding the Hudson and Holland Scholars Pro Summer Program in Ghana and the Indiana University Mauer School of Law Summer in so Southern Africa Program. Additionally, he has published more than 60 works on crucial topics such as race and education. He is also one of the original participants and founders of the Critical Race Theory Workshop in the People of Color Conference. Dr. Louis Menand is a professor of English with Harvard's Faculty of Arts and Science. He attended Panoma College and received his PhD from Columbia University. Before arriving at Harvard, he was also a distinguished professor of English at the Graduate Center of the City University of New York. He has published numerous works such as the Marketplace of Ideas and the Metaphysical Club the later of which explored the history of American intellectual and philosophical life in the 19th and 20th centuries. Notably, he received a Pulitzer Prize in history for this work, as well as the Francis Parkman Prize from the Society of American Historians. He has also worked as a contributor and then staff writer for The New Yorker since 1991. Here, he has published pieces such as The Changing Meaning of Affirmative Action. In 2016, Dr. Mnand was very notably awarded the National Humanities Medal by President Barack Obama. We also have Dr. Jacoby Williams, a professor of history and African-American diaspora studies here at Indiana University. He is a Chicago native and graduated with a BA in history from Southern Illinois University Carbondale with his MA in African-American studies and a PhD in history, both from UCLA. He is a notable scholar in areas such as civil rights, black power, social justice, and African-American history. And he regularly speaks on these issues at lectures both domestic and abroad. He has also worked as a consultant in areas such as civil rights issues and African-American history for the Andrew w, w. Mellon Foundation, Southern Poverty Law Center, the National Civil Rights Museum, and the Social Justice Institute at the University of Illinois, Chicago. He has published works from, such as his book, From the Bullet to the Ballot, the Illinois Chapter of the Black Panthers, Black Panther Party and Racial Coalition Politics in Chicago, and has many peer-reviewed publications and journals such as the Journal for Civil and Human Rights. Some of his awards include the Mellon Foundation funded Black Metropolitan Research Consortium Fellowship and the Big Ten Academic Alliance Academic Leadership Program Award. On behalf of both SB and BALSA, thank you so much for sharing your time with us. And we thank you, especially to BALSA for organizing the speaker series. Please enjoy this panel. Hi, my name is Ashley Skurlock, and this year I'm serving as the secretary for Indiana University's um, Black Law Students Association. At this time, we would like to afford each speaker a few minutes to tell us a little bit about their studies as far as affirmative action goes. First, um, first, Dr. Williams, could you give us a historical context of affirmative action? Yes, can you hear me okay? We can hear you. 
So um, I'd like to set the frame by uh, at least articulating to our audience exactly how our, our, our country structure is, is set up. So uh, economics commands politics and politics commands society techniques. And under this model, uh, especially as it relates historically to African-Americans, economic justice is ingrained in the system, uh, the injustice component. So in 1965, just give some historical context, let's take us back in time. Um, then Stokely Carmichael, who later changed his name to Kwame Ture uh, as a member of the Student Nonviolent Coordinated Committee and an undergraduate college student, Howard, he canvassed the states of Mississippi and Alabama organizing black residents and registering black communities to vote. And Stokely, as a student, coined the term institutional racism, which he identified as practices um, in organizations, institutions, or systems uh, that result in the subordination and control over some racial groups and the inequitable distribution of power, privilege, access, and opportunity. That same year, uh, with Martin Luther King on the stage with him in Mississippi, uh, he coins the term Black Power. And Black Power is a call for economic and political control of one's own life and community, self-determination. So due to the confluence of racism and capitalism in American institutions, Black power advocates believe that America could never achieve its ideals of democracy and thus call for a revolution to dismantle the entire economic system. Also understanding the structure of America, civil rights activists, mostly symbolized by the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, also call for a revolution, but a revolution of values against racism, capitalism, and militarism. And so the revolution of values model was an attempt to work through um, what he called established American institutions, and in the process focused the nation's attention on a concept called affirmative action, a set of ideals, what they identified as a set of ideas uh, and programs aimed at compensating African Americans primarily in the beginning for past discrimination by providing access and opportunity in hiring and school admissions. So employment and education are but two of several guarantees of economic progress and upper mobility in the American structure. So they focus on these aspects primarily, but I could talk about others as well, maybe later question and answer that deals with um, housing and segregation, some other issues. But in terms of economic mobility and, and righting the wrongs of past injustices, from, and in the beginning of this affirmative action campaign, they focus on the economic progress uh, in terms of hiring, employment, and, and school admissions. So, uh, just to give some more historical context, institutional, institutional racism in the North and West operated quite differently than it did in the South. Uh, institutional racism that dictated race relations in the North and West were not defined by legal codes or uh, black only or white only signs as they were the, the kind of norms in the South. Instead, longstanding social codes created de facto segregation that mandated blacks could not enter, live, work, or even shop in certain places created the racial barriers that existed in, north, in the North and the West. So racial progress was slower in the North and the West because institutional racism and discrimination was deeply ingrained in the social and economic structure and was not marked by laws or policy that could easily be attacked, i.e. what the Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act was supposed to do, attack these so-called legal barriers. But the practices was taking place on the ground and it's very much understood as a part of hegemonic discourse. This is how races are supposed to interact with one another. And so you have this, these, these episodes of implicit bias and other forms that target uh, directly in many cases, but sometimes unconsciously of uh, the access and opportunity of African-Americans and those on the margins. So affirmative action is an attempt to alleviate institutional racism. So civil rights activists who did not support Black power advocates' ideas of revolution adopted a new approach to attaining economic and political justice. Affirmative action policies thus were designed to work through established institutions to reduce the national poverty rate, eliminate discrimination in the workforce, to provide access and opportunity for admissions. Reverend Dr. King, for example, and other activists argued that economic disabilities and disparities and racism produced required in the past required some comp compens compensatory consideration for the handicaps that Blacks had inherited from the past. 
And until the late 1960s, racism was thought of as something practiced by individuals or mandated by law. But many argued that institutions operated just as unfairly, hence Stokely Carmichael's coining the term institutional racism. So employers uh, based their hiring, promotion, and firing decisions on the accepted premise that black workers were inferior to white workers, reinforcing this assumption in the process. Housing discrimination, which prevented blacks from living in most places, except sub substandard segregated neighborhoods, was based on the same premise of this idea of black inferiority. And the legal and criminal justice system functioned uh, with prejudice because it too is, and still is, steeped in centuries of racism. So after the Bakke decision in the 1970s, 1978, if I'm not mistaken, um, there was a concerted effort on the part of conservatives and just to speak quite frankly about it, those who subscribe to white supremacist ideology, racism, and policies of exclusion um, it's, it had this concerted effort to eliminate affirmative action. Thus, affirmative action has evolved from its original form, as mentioned earlier, to address compensatory justice to make up for past wrongdoings. Today, it's mostly focused on code words such as minorities or diversity, most, which mostly means white women or maybe LGBTQ issues and so forth but both are usually devoid of equity and justice, nevertheless. So for example, Edward Blum, which I'm assuming we're gonna talk about today in some capacity, his, his, his most recent attacks, first against the University of Texas by using a white plan of later against Harvard using Asian Americans, is just the most recent example of this, these kinds of efforts. So I'll end here, cause I could go on and on, but I, I do wanna make clear before I end that um, affirmative action is necessary to provide access and opportunity to those excluded who historically overwhelmingly have been poor black folk uh, or ex excluded by institutions that would otherwise not afford access on its own without pressure to do so. But most importantly, what I want to point out is this qualification issue. Qualification is key. One of the misconceptions of affirmative action is that less qualified folks are taking spots from those who are more qualified. And I always have to call BS on this. Affirmative action folks forces, it, it, affirmative action forces the gatekeepers to also consider qualified minorities. So it's not letting in unqualified people, it's letting in people who otherwise would be overlooked for various, for various reasons, overwhelmingly do with race and gender. And so it's, it's, a, it's a way of forcing gatekeepers to look at the process. And even on this campus, we've made certain efforts to try to alleviate those issues to no avail um, as we have, what, 4% of the student body out of 50,000 students are African-American. Um, even organizations such as CRESS, which was created out of student activism on this campus to deal with these lack of diversity equity issues. And I got to pick on my own department, the history department itself, as we've hosted several of these CRESS postdocs to diversify our ranks and yet to hire any. And so even with the forces at play that are not directly targeted as from reaction policies, the work that uh, is still being done, even on this campus, demonstrates the need for affirmative action in our everyday lives. So I'll end there before I begin to ramble about more of the political issues that we face on this campus and in our society today. Thank you, Professor Williams, so much for that um, background. Next, I would like to, to move to Dr. Menand. I know you recently wrote an article titled Changing the Meaning of Affirmative Action. Um, could you tell us a little bit about what that means or what you mean by that? Uh, thank you. Uh, first of all, thank you for inviting me to participate in this discussion. Um, it's incredibly important discussion because the future of affirmative action programs of various kinds is very much in jeopardy given the makeup of the Supreme Court. Um, and we're gonna probably see some changes in the law. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about, I'm gonna pick up on something that Professor Williams mentioned about university admissions um, and affirmative action. And I'm gonna look at the three major Supreme Court cases that uh, have dealt with that, uh, with those programs. Um, Affirmative action in university admissions is still constitutionally protected under the rulings of the Supreme Court. And that's the, we suspect that that's what happens when the Harvard case goes before the Supreme Court, which it may do next year, that those precedents will be overturned. The first one that Professor Williams has already mentioned is the Bakke case, 1978. And you probably know that the Bakke case has to do with uh, admissions at the Medical School at the University of California at Davis. 
Um, and the case is the is the benchmark precedent for uh, admissions, affirmative action admissions programs. What's complicated about that is that there are six different opinions in the court's decision in Baki, and the lead opinion by Justice Powell uh, gives reasoning that no other justice agrees with. And Powell's reasoning is important to understand because that's the reasoning that has guided the court since 1978 in, uh, in its rulings on affirmative action programs. So Powell begins by saying that the rationale for affirmative action programs in medical school admission in this case cannot be the fact that certain groups were historically disadvantaged. He says, quote, there is no principal basis for deciding which groups would merit heightened judicial solicitude and which would not. Courts would be asked to evaluate the extent of the prejudice and consequent harm suffered by various minority groups. Those whose societal industry in, in, injury is thought to exceed some arbitrary level of tolerability would then be entitled to preferential classifications at the expense of individuals belonging to other groups. Those classifications would be free from exacting judicial scrutiny. As these preferences began to have their desired effect and the consequences of past discrimination were undone, new judicial rankings would be necessary. The kind of variable sociological and political analysis necessary to produce such rankings simply does not lie within judicial competence even if they were otherwise politically feasible and socially desirable, end quote. So he's rejecting the argument that certain groups because of historical history of disadvantage should uh, uh, benefit from affirmative action programs. He writes these words just 14 years after the passage of the Civil Rights Act and he can't name which groups have suffered harm from history of discrimination. But, how, but Powell did uphold the constitutionality of affirmative action programs on a completely different constitutional ground, the First Amendment. He argued that the First Amendment protects the academic freedom of colleges and universities to decide who to admit as long as the educational goals are legitimate. So what is the educational goal achieved by using race as a factor in admissions? Diversity. Powell wrote, quote, petitioner, that is UC Davis, must be viewed as seeking to achieve a goal that is of paramount importance in fulfilling of its mission. That goal was far more focused than the remedying of the effects of quote, societal discrimination an amorphous concept of injury that may be ageless in its reach into the past. In the concurrence signed by four justices, Brennan, White, Marshall, and Blackman, they said, quote, the central meeting of today's opinions is the government may take race into account when it acts not to demean or insult any racial group, but to remedy disadvantages cast on minorities by past racial prejudice at least where appropriate findings have been made by judicial, legislative, or administrative bodies. It's exactly what the court said, uh, Powell said the court's decision did not do. So in a five to four decision in which four justices upheld affirmative action programs on grounds of remediation for past injuries, the precedent setting opinion rejects that argument, proposes instead a rationale based on the educational value of diversity. And that became the reasoning in the two next affirmative action cases Grutter against Bollinger in 2003 and Fisher against Texas in 2016. So the Grutter case involved the University of Michigan Law School Admissions Program, which is an affirmative action program. And in the court's opinion by Sandra Day O'Connor, the court held that the law school's current admissions program considers race as one factor among many in an effort to assemble a student body that is diverse in ways broader than race. Because a lottery, another kind of form of admissions, lottery would make that kind of nuanced or judgment impossible. It would effectively sacrifice all other educational values, not to mention every other kind of diversity. All applicants have the opportunity to highlight their own potential diversity contributions through the submission of a personal statement, whether it's a recommendation, an essay describing the ways in which the applicant will contribute to the life and diversity of the law school. So the concept of diversity is expanded beyond the category of racial difference to include many other individual talents that might be taken into account in college admissions. And this is repeated again in Fisher versus Texas. So the first Fisher case is 2013. There's a, it's repeated in Fisher called Fisher II in 2016. This case involved the University of Texas, Professor Williams already mentioned it, which a white woman, Fisher, was denied admission. She claimed on grounds that she was white. The court's opinion in, uh, in Fisher 1 is written by Justice Kennedy, 
And he says, adopting Powell's diversity rationale, a system that selected every student through class rank alone would exclude the star athlete or the musician whose grades suffered because of daily practices and training, it would exclude a talented young biologist who struggled to maintain above average grades in humanities classes, and it would exclude a student whose freshman year grades were poor because of a family crisis, end quote. In other words, the concept of diversity per se, detached from the history of racial discrimination has become the rationale for affirmative action admissions program. Blackness is put on a par with the ability to play the flute. People now say things like, what about diversity of ideology? So that's how separate re represented the same moral demand. But the reason we have affirmative action, as Professor Williams has eloquently said, is that we once had slavery and Jim Crow and redlining and racial confidence. We had all white police forces and all white union locals and all white college campuses and all white law firms. To paraphrase Nixon's Secretary of Labor, George Shultz, for hundreds of years, the United States had a racial quota. It was zero. Affirmative action is an attempt to redress an injustice done to black people. You could look at it this way. For most of American history, blacks were systematically denied educational and employment opportunity, not as individuals, but because they were members of a group. Now, when they ask for assistance in remedying the effects of that history of exclusion, the court says, sorry, we only recognize individual rights. Thank you so much for that, Dr. Munand. Um, we really appreciate that. That was um, very good. Um, next, Professor Brown, I was wondering if you could kind of put um, what the speakers before you just said into kind of a legal perspective, um, um, kind of how it affects us in the legal profession today. Yes, um, I, I too want to thank the organizers for giving me this opportunity to talk and to be on on a panel with with my good friend Professor Williams and with Professor Menand. Um, so I, I will pick up from their two points because I think they made some very very significant and important points here. I want to then fold this into the way the legal system dealt with these issues because both Professor Williams and Professor Menand talked about situating affirmative action within a social justice context. And I don't think there's any question at all that that was where so affirmative action starts uh, in the 1960s. But I wanna back up to a second to the Supreme Court's opinion in Brown versus Board of Education in 1954, because that's really the beginning of this revitalization of our 14th Amendment and using it to try to attack racial discrimination. The problem with Brown versus Board of Education from the very beginning is at the very beginning where we have this opinion that everyone considers to be the hallmark of equality in America was itself based upon certain racist assumptions. What the Supreme Court says in Brown versus Board of Education, because what they come to in Brown is a situation where the physical facilities and the tangible resources between the black schools and the white schools are equal. So they have to find the existence of a constitutional harm. And the constitutional harm that they conclude exists is that segregation with the sanction of law has the tendency to retard the mental development of Negro children in ways unlikely ever to be undone. So our society starts the school desegregation process based upon this notion from the Supreme Court that this history of racial discrimination only harmed Black people. It did not talk about the harm that was done to whites, even though that harm was introduced to the court in creating these false senses of superiority. So as we then start through the desegregation process, more or less under this agreement from Brown, there is the assumption that you should not expect that the black kids who are going to go to our selective higher educational institutions are going to be as qualified as the white kids. 
but because they've been damaged and only them have been damaged. Um, we have to take that into account and effectively cut them a break. Then we come to, to the Bakke decision in 1978 with both Professor Williams and Professor Manan talked about. And Bakke does this unbelievable sleight of hand. And, and both of them point to this, right? Bakke is a four to four opinion. Four justices say you cannot consider race at all. Four justices say quotas are okay. Powell's the fifth justice who renders the opinion. Um, and Powell says in rendering that opinion, it's okay to consider race as a factor, but it's not okay um, to, to, but it's not okay to use quotas. And the only rationale that Powell accepts is this First Amendment justification of diversity. So all of the social justice justifications for affirmative action go out the window at that moment. Also what goes out the window at that moment is the primary interpretation of the 14th Amendment's Equal Protection Clause. Because when I went to law school, we were told that the Equal Protection Clause was there to protect discrete and insular minority groups from failures of the majoritarian political process. In other words, governmental legislation that harmed minorities is what violated the Equal Protection Clause. Governmental legislation that helped minorities did not because that was not a failure of the majoritarian political process. Powell, in his opinion, in Bakke, throws that entire history out of out, reconceptualizes the Equal Protection Clause as now a clause to protect only the rights of individuals. And when you think about what it is Black people complain about in American society, we don't complain about being victims as individuals. We claim complain about being victims as groups. But you cannot make a group-oriented claim of discrimination if you have to put it in language of individuals. So it reworked who was protected by the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment, which went away from Blacks now to effectively whites. And, and once, once that move is made, uh, Bakke then becomes the dominant way to think about affirmative action. And while it only based itself on diversity, for the most part, it wasn't until the mid 90s, 90, 1994 in particular, decision comes out of the Fourth Circuit, where the Fourth Circuit rejects a, a minority scholarship program that is based upon the history of discrimination at the University of Maryland just for black students. And the Fourth Circuit says, look, we read Powell's opinion in Bakke to say that if you're gonna take account of race in the college situation, it has to be for purposes of diversity. So now from the mid nineties coming forward, we get this reinterpretation of affirmative action based on diversity. And as both Professor Menon and Professor Williams have pointed out, once you unmoor this from the social justice rationale and you make it on diversity, the ability to really attack the problems um, of race and the history of racial injustice that we have in our society has been substantially compromised. Thank you, Professor Brown. We will now move into our moderator Q&A portion. And for our audience, if you do have questions during this portion, you can feel free to put them in the Q&A section. And like I said, Ashley and I will get to them at the end. Now, in the spirit of free discussion, we do ask that our panelists, please just feel free to unmute yourselves when you have an answer to the question after it's posed. So many of you mentioned the changing notions of diversity as we've gone throughout history. So as we stand today, who is currently benefiting the most from affirmative action? And who do you think should be truly benefiting from affirmative action? Uh, white women are benefiting the most. And as I said in my remarks, I, it's 
it's intended to remedy injustice to black people. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I would say it depends on what you mean by affirmative action. So I think if you're talking in the within the limited concept of admissions to selective higher education institutions, I think that's really still primarily black and brown people. Uh, but the concept shouldn't be limited in that way. And, and certainly what Professor Mendon, and certainly one of the things he's pointing to is think about Title IX and how it has restructured scholarships. Effectively, what we saw with Title IX requiring equality of scholarships between males and females was this wholesale reduction of scholarships for football in particular and basketball secondarily in order then to create scholarship opportunities for primarily white women who are engaged in athletic competition. Um, so we see a tremendous benefit that they receive there. And then if you talk about, in, um, if you talk about government contracting, City of Richmond versus Croson in 1989 significantly reduced the ability of minority businessmen to get contracts from governmental entities. Uh, however, the rules didn't strike down set us minority didn't strike down set asides for women owned businesses. So they were able to benefit from government contracting in a way that minority businesses no longer could. Of course, I, I would still root um, all of this social uh, affirmative action writ large in the social justice uh, uh, rationale. Uh, I just to echo the sentiments of my colleagues, is white women are overwhelmingly benefiting from our current, and at least for the last 25 to 30 years, front of action legislation. Uh, and I think it's important to point out because typically, especially for those on the right, is they use talking points, is they like to couch affirmative front of action as only this race-based structure. Um, and the front of action is there to offer access and opportunity to minorities, which include women. Women are also a minority, also folks with disabilities and others. And so we fail to include those folks in, this, in the conversation. And I point this out because most of the folks who are currently attacking in front of action happen to be white women, like in Texas and Michigan and some other places, who have overwhelmingly benefited from the process. And so they're really advocating against their own interests. Uh, by picking up talking points for those on the right. So there's a contradiction at play, uh, even though I overwhelmingly see um, the disparities in terms of, depends on what field we're looking at, but let's talk about admissions since I work on a college campus. And, and I mentioned the student population here. IU and other institutions would claim that they don't practice institutional racism. And I give my colleagues the benefit of the doubt that they are uh, constantly trying to avoid them, but now we use different markers like zip codes. So you don't actually actually use race, but you know what demographics make up certain zip codes, which is why the student population looks the way that it does today. And so there's ways of getting around that. But even class is part of that as well. So I often point to my rural white students, you also benefit from front of action because <laughs> you happen to be on the lower end of the spectrum in terms of social economic status, which is also part of the minority status. Um, that the class aspects. And so you find folks advocating against their own interests when they only focus on the black white dichotomy of the so called legislation. Our next question um, Do businesses and organizations truly support um, affirmative action policies, or are they simply just checking off boxes in order to look good to the public? I wouldn't say simply. I mean, that's important to them. So, I mean, in Grutter, um, uh, the 2003 case that we talked about, uh, amicus briefs were submitted by all these big corporations like Intel and Dow Chemical, who supported affirmative action in university admissions because they wanted a diverse workforce. Um, now, from a strictly economic point of view, it's irrational to discriminate. Because if somebody wants to buy your product, do you want to sell to them? You don't want to, you know, and you want your workforce to look like the people you're selling your product to. So, 
I mean, I think it's in their own interest to support affirmative action. Generally, they do. Um, this all happened in the 70s, really, in which largely because of the federal contracting business that we talked about for a second. Um, pressure was put by the government on companies doing business with the government or with the state to diversify. And that did have a very positive effect in terms of the minority representation of businesses. Yeah. I, I would say, and, and, and I know Professor Williams is going to chuckle when I say this, um, I don't extol the virtues of capitalism. <laughs> As I indicated, he was going to chuckle. Um, but for the business community, there is an economic motive there that does not exist for colleges and universities. So for the business community, you know, you have customers uh, who you have to service in ways in which they most want to be serviced. And the same with employees, you just simply have to have a diverse uh, workforce in order to have enough employees for your businesses. So many businesses take affirmative action and diversity and inclusion much more seriously um, than we do in universities. <laughs> Dr. Williams, would you like to respond to that? I think my colleagues have pretty much summed it up. Um, I'm always hesitant to, to comment on the intentions of businesses because they are so diverse. So it depends on what industry you're talking about, what time period, what their intentions are. Um, if I speak in general terms, it would be from a pessimistic point of view, um, especially in the way in which capitalist works, capitalism works. It, this is forced upon them. Um, a lot of businesses feel that way. If their business, they should be able to run it the way that they want. At the bottom line, it's about their shareholders or their profit. And if race diversity fits that, so be it. But if it doesn't, they shouldn't be forced to do so. It'll be the position of some business owners. So it's always a controversial uh, conversation to have when we're talking about business and industry. Um, so I try to let the experts who actually study that comment, because I don't. I'm not an expert in, in that area. A lot of us get these PhDs and think we're experts in everything. I, I'm not one of those people. So I'm hesitant to offer my two cents besides my informed opinion. I'll leave it at that. Thank you. So given your recent events, how would you respond to the notion that affirmative action negatively affects certain groups such as Asian Americans or white men? Well, I'll take a stab at that. Um, so I, I mentioned some of this earlier in regards to folks who are advocate against their own um, personal gains, uh, the idea of someone's being excluded at the expense, the, the inclusion of African-Americans in particular is at the exclusion of others. That's the typical quote unquote reverse racism bullshit, just to be quite honest about it. I'm tired of having these arguments and debates about uh, that, that are farces. Um, in terms of white males, uh, if you look at the demographics in almost any industry, we use the term glass ceiling for a reason. <laughs> white males don't seem to have that problem um, unless there's some other component attached to it. Most, most recently or egregiously would have something to do with their sexuality. But typically heterosexual um, privileged white males have a lot of access and opportunity, typically also the gatekeepers. So they're not being excluded. All the affirmative action policies, especially if we talk about admissions, just to be specific about it, is making sure there's also access to opportunity for other qualified people as well, not to replace. There's only so many slots that could be afforded um, in, if we're talking about law schools, for example, since this is a law school form, um, that any graduate schools, I'm a director of graduate studies in AAADS, there's only so many slots that we have. And we all value diversity. Diversity is a virtue. If we only admit one particular group, there isn't diversity. So we have to, as gatekeepers, make a conscious effort on how we use methodology to include everyone and make a space to make space for everyone. So in terms of Asian Americans, uh, I'm torn on this one. Um, I will actually advise people to defer to one of my colleagues, Ellen Wu in the history department. She has, in my opinion, probably the most foremost expert 
on Asian Americans and the modern minority myth and affirmative action and the ways in which those, those aspects play out in our current context. So I don't wanna speak uh, with authority on this. I think she's the expert on that. Uh, I spent a lot of time in California, 13 years um, at UCLA, uh, which we dubbed as a moniker uh, for black folks, we got HBCUs. We, we began to call UCLA a, a HACU because Asian Americans outnumbered every demographic on that campus because of Prop 209, which ended front of action. Um, and as an activist, I was very involved in trying to alleviate the lack of black and brown people on campus. We had a total of 33,000 students um, in the first four years I was there. And a total of, I can't make this number up, 194 African-American students out of 33,000. That included law school, business school, football, basketball, undergrad, everybody, 194 out of 33,000. But there were more Asian-Americans there um, for, because of the ways in which the methods were set up in terms of standardized tests and that demographic tended to do well, even better than white males. So what are we saying? Asians are replacing white males? No. Uh, and should they have access to admissions at UCLA? Yes, but there should be some other factors at play. Uh, and so that's what's taking place now. I think there was a decision that came down today, um, some circuit court, if I'm not mistaken, regarding Harvard uh, with this, I don't wanna give him any more uh, respect, so I won't say his name again. And these cases that they're pushing forward to divide and conquer people, these are, this, is, this divide and rule is not a new phenomenon. Um, and so in that case, Harvard was, was by at least according to the judge, um, deemed as not having violated any policy in terms of emissions. And I think the, the lawyers did a great job of articulating the growth of Asian American student enrollment over the last few years, last 10 years at least, to demonstrate that their own pace, their pace is egregiously higher than even the national population pace in terms of Asian American representation. And I don't like using Asian American because we just dub all these folks into one box. These folks are different. So even when we have these conversations, white versus Asian American, I have to step back and say, which Asian Americans are we talking about? Because they're not all the same. We talk about Koreans, Japanese, Asian Americans, South Asians. Uh, they're not all the same. So where and who's been excluded according to whom? And so when you force people to think more critically about these concepts um, and pull the layers back, you realize it's just a lot of smoke. Uh, African American, you look at the largest demographics on any college campus, for example, white males are not suffering. They're just not. Uh, so who's being excluded? I don't see a lot of people look like me. I'm often the only one in the classroom of 60 or more students as the professor, the only black male or African American. So where are people who look like me? And those other demographics we mentioned are there. And so I see, think we need to do a better, a better effort in terms of expanding the opportunity to access for African-American, black and brown, other marginalized groups. Uh, so I, I, I think I'm rambling now, so maybe I, I'll shut up, but um, to some, what I'm trying to argue is um, divide and conquer this, this white and quote unquote, horrible term Asian-American, this social construction, and throw all these groups in one box as uh, other versus, one versus the other is a divide and conquer method because uh, eventually, what's gonna happen is, at least what took place at UCLA, you have white males arguing they were being displaced by Asian Americans. And so it's always someone who's being othered, so to speak, at the expense of what's the undergird, which is white supremacy and this idea of whiteness and value of it. So white access has never diminished. So I'm always pushed back against that as BS. And so it doesn't matter if Asians are, get, are being admitted or Latin Americans or whomever, um, white <laughs> enrollment or access is not diminishing. And, I, and that's a pessimist, it never will, um, which is why we keep it, continue to advocate for the inclusion of others, which also includes women and folks um, of various sexual orientation backgrounds as well. Um, well, <laughs> I, I'll take a stab at this. Um, I, I, I will say one of the things about um, the issue about Asians, and of course, you know, Professor Minan knows a lot about this because he's at Harvard and that's the place where Asians are currently suing. 
Um, they constitute about 6% of the American population, but they're over 20% of Harvard students. And my understanding is an internal study in Harvard said if you did everything purely by the numbers, they would have been 43%. Um, and if you've been watching the SAT scores, the gaps between whites and Asians on the SAT scores have been growing rather significantly over the last 20 years so that now Asians are about 100 points higher than, than whites on the SAT scores. But what I wanna do is drill down into this issue about whether or not, um, or who's being disadvantaged by affirmative action. And, and, and I wanna reject sort of the framing of the question. Because when we talk about African Americans being included in higher education, selective higher educational institutions, or for that matter, Latinx, typically what we're talking about is populations that are 13 to 15 percent of the American population, but then they're being included in selective higher education institutions at maybe five or six percent. So they're underrepresented with the affirmative action programs that we currently have in place. And we put the onus on them to justify the fact that they're underrepresented as opposed to other groups who are overrepresented. But there's a more important issue here too. And, and that's the issue about the qualifications that we use to determine merit to begin with. And, and we constantly um, will get the argument, Abigail Fisher made this argument, if I were black, I would have gotten admitted to the University of Texas. Um, so she starts with an idea that our standards for determining admissions are themselves racially neutral. That you can simply exchange a black person for a white person and would make absolutely no difference at all. But if we took Abigail Fisher and, and changed her and made her black, if we effectively accepted her counterfactual and said, let's, let's make it true, let's make you black. Well, what would then happen? Well, let's think about it. She'd have different parents than the parents she had. She would grow up in different neighborhoods and she grew up in. She'd attend different schools. She would go to different places to worship. Uh, she'd listen to different radio stations. She'd watch different movies and television programs. She'd read different books. She'd have different friends. She'd root for different sports heroes. She would root for different comic book heroes. Um, she would eat at different restaurants. Right? You see my point. When you change the race, you change everything. And among the everything that would have been changed would have been her standardized test scores. Uh, so I, I think for me, the fundamental problem is that when we look at brown and black and brown students and we try to determine their merit, you have to include as part of that calculus the additional obstacles that they have to overcome. Um, I say this with my law students all the time. You know, if I lined up my black law students in a line of a thousand blacks and thought about it in terms of intelligence, in terms of future income potential, in terms of ability to influence others, they're in the top 1% of blacks. But for my white students, maybe top 3%. Uh, and yet it's the black students who would be questioned as opposed to the white students. So I, I would start by critiquing the notion that you could even develop racially neutral cri meritocratic criteria. Uh, because I actually think that that's where the major problem is, is that we simply do not take account of the additional obstacles that are put in the way of, of black and brown people. Asians are different, different altogether because so many of them are immigrants. And there's a very selective immigration policy that we use here in the United States. So right, think of who immigrants are. First off, they're self-selected. Uh, they've got to be ones who are more dynamic, who are willing to leave their homes to come halfway around the world. 
they're going to have to have the money to do this. And when you're talking about American educational institutions, where typically they don't get a lot of financial way, they're going to have to have a lot of money to do this. So, so you're talking about a very creaming of the top of Asians that you're bringing into the United States and then saying, oh, they do better than everyone else. Well, what would you expect? Let me stop there. Oh, sorry. No, we could. <laughs> okay. Well, in the interest of time, we'll go ahead and move on and just take one quick question from our audience. Um, so, with the current makeup of the Supreme Court and the possibility of an affirmative action case coming to the Supreme Court, firstly, what do you think is the future of affirmative action? And secondly, could expanding the size of the Supreme Court be a positive way to help save affirmative action? Uh, I think this is for Professor Brown, <laughs> not for me. I think that I th just I started by saying that I think people expect this court will time out affirmative action admissions programs. I mean, one thing to note about both the Bakke and Ruder decisions is that in both cases the court said we don't think we'll need to do this forever. And the court, this court, the Roberts Court is already in the case of the Voting Rights Act said we could time out this provision, the preclearance provision. So. That's the kind of logic I would expect from them. I, I think I expect that 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 kind of logic as well. Um, we we know that we have three justices who dissented in the most recent Fisher case, so we know that three justices up there are likely to want to hear the Harvard case and want to use it as a platform to strike down any consideration of race. Then we have the three Trump justices. Um, now, okay, I'm not overly optimistic about the Trump justices. Trump is someone who has made the point that he's been a better president for Black people with the possible single exception of Abraham Lincoln. Um, if that is truly the case, one with hope that his justices would not line up in the majority and interpret the Equal Protection Clause to eliminate a program that's so critical um, for Black people. Um, but, but at least I'll say this, um, when, when Grutter was decided in 2003, I was absolutely convinced that the Supreme Court was gonna use that as an opportunity to strike down affirmative action. There were five justices on the Supreme Court who had made it very clear that they were against affirmative action, including Justice O'Connor. And Justice O'Connor changes her voice and her vote uh, in Grutter. Uh, when you get to Fisher in 2013, once again, you had five justices who had been pretty much ardent opponents of affirmative action and then Justice Kennedy changes. Um, now we, 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 we're probably looking for more than that, more, more than lightning striking once. Uh, it's going to have to strike a couple of times. Um, if not, then America will move into a very, very different phase um, if affirmative action is in fact struck down. Um, and and I'll, I'll just leave it there. You'll have to have another panel for that. Yeah, uh, I'm not one as an activist scholar to rely on the courts to make decisions that determine our lives. Uh, as a historian, I turn back to those activists I mentioned before, whether they're black power civil rights groups was taking place as the activism at the ground uh, and understanding that they're their plights can be solved federally, but immediately at the local level. And so uh, legislation is one of those ways in which you can overcome some of these issues of trying to pass legislation in some cases. Most recently in California, as you saw, that was an attempt that was a groundswell this summer. Uh, after George Floyd, we put a lot of effort and stock and organizing throughout that state. Um, it overwhelmingly went blue 
uh, overwhelmingly, I think Biden got 60 something percent of the vote. And those same people voted against <laughs> Proposition 16 for affirmative action, which we didn't see coming. Um, so you got all these so-called progressives uh, involved in chanting Black Lives Matter on the sidelines and in the streets with us. But when they go to polls anonymously, they do something else. Um, so legislation still, I believe, uh, one, of the, one of the egregious methods we have besides the courts to try to solve this issue. Uh, maybe not always, hopefully leaving it to the voters was a way of solving the issue and not relying on these state legislatures. But even leaving to the voters didn't um, have a, a, a positive effect. So that's a, another conversation of the panel to talk about why that is, even in our current phenomenon. And I think um, Dr. Brown might want to chime in on this. But, uh, this is just really quick because I'm not sure everyone knows what you're talking about when you're talking oh, about okay. Proposition 16. But but I also wanted to make the point we're talking about a constitutional decision. And a constitutional decision cannot be overridden by either Congress or state legislatures. If the Supreme Court says you cannot take account of race and ethnicity in the admissions process, simply put, the only way to change that is going to be to change the Constitution. But you may want to tell them what Proposition 16. Oh, oh, well, Proposition 16 was a concerted effort to try to overturn Proposition 209. So in the late 90s, mid to late 90s, led by African-Americans such as Ward Connolly and these other conservatives, they initiate this Proposition 209 to alleviate, um, well, not alleviate, to eliminate affirmative action from um, public policy in terms of emissions, in terms of who gets government contracts, uh, employment episodes that deals with um, public, and public and government agencies. So Proposition 16 was a way to repeal Proposition 209 and it failed, um, I think by 14 points, something like that. It wasn't even close, like 57 of 43 or something like that, um, which was a surprise to us as we saw this as a way to alleviate some of the problems I talked about at UCLA, where we don't have a lot of diversity on that campus. It's a state, state run university. And so what does, what do we do now? So how do we focus our efforts to convince our so-called allies that this is beneficial to them too? And I think social media misinformation, a whole host, I don't, I haven't studied this. So I'm, it's just my informed opinion played a role in this in terms of, um, pitting groups against each other, especially when we talk about Asian Americans as this large group when they're separate in, in these particular categories uh, as being excluded at the expense of another. And what does this mean? And who gets to make the decisions? How does, what what, what the, the methodology look like? And so those questions were not clear out, or clearly outlined in proposition. Not all, I think some of them were, I just when you go to vote, some people just don't read the ballot. You just say yes and no based on the commercials or the social media or the bubble that you live in. Uh, and I think that's what happens. So we have to do a better job informing people. And in terms of a constitutional amendment, when's the last time we had a constitutional amendment? <laughs> right. Um, can't hold my breath on that one. If that's our only hope, we, we are hopeless uh, with the way in which polarization is taking place in our current context. I don't see that alleviating anytime soon. White supremacy would not let go of the reins and they're using fear and uncertainty and doubt to fuel the, the, the masses of their base because folks are realizing that you can get overwhelmingly, which Trump got, overwhelmingly the white vote and still lose an election. And even Lindsey Graham and other Republicans are on, on record saying that if we rely on mail-in voting, meaning giving everyone in their due, due diligence, their civic duty to vote, we'll never have another Republican president with this racist, white supremacist ideology that they espouse to. And they're correct. And the demographics are changing, uh, especially between 18 and 35 year olds becoming the largest demographic in our society. And every year there's new 18 year olds coming to the voting booth. They, they are right. So you can see the, the reason why polarization in terms of racial dynamics are playing out, white versus all these other groups. Uh, and this does not equate all whites as Trump supporters, because we did get a significant number of white votes, but it's overwhelmingly won the white vote. And 
and this polarization in our current context in terms of changing law, um, it's going to be bloody uh, in some senses. And I use that term deliberately because Trump is putting out this battle cry, his sons and others. It's coming eventually. I hope I'm wrong, knock on wood, that no one gets, dies or gets hurt, but it's coming in some way, shape or form because the man won't concede. And so I just don't see a constitutional amendment saving us in that regard. We have to get in the streets. We have to organize we have to at the local level, bottom up, grassroots up. Uh, much consistent with folks in the past. Black Lives Matter is doing that in all these various groups, at the local levels, organized the grassroots level up. And maybe we can put some pressure on folks to change some amendments, maybe an executive order, I don't know. But if we're waiting on the constitution. We, we'd be waiting for three generations before something like that happens. And now I apologize. I don't want to cut off this conversation. I wish this talk could have been <laughs> two, maybe three hours. But I do want to thank all of our panelists for joining us today and graciously agreeing to be a part of this discussion. Thank you to our attendees for joining us this evening. And a big thank you to my Balsa eBoard for helping organize this event. And a special shout out to Ron Turner for doing a lot of work on the back end of this event. Thank you all and have a great evening. Thank you.